Hello and welcome to another video. So we're finally here and we're finally doing the how to, how to make your own fishing tackle. Now I am going to keep it to predator tackle only. Maybe down the line I may show you how to make other types of uh, tackle, be it uh, tench floats or cruising carp floats or avon floats, you name it. Maybe I'll go down that route but at the moment we're just going to keep it predator tackle. Um, it's mainly going to be floats. Uh, I'm going to make show you how to make uh, a pike gazette bung. I'm going to show you how to make a dead bait pencil, uh, a Xander float. How I how I see a Xander float, there is actually no reflection to what a Xander float looks like. There are different types, especially on the continent, of how they look like. But um, we all know what a gazette bung looks like. We all know what a, um, a dead bait pencil looks like. But in this particular video today. Um, it's gonna go back to where my roots started pretty much in fishing um, the one fish that absolutely captured my imagination and is probably my favorite fish alongside pike it's old Percy on the windowsill is the perch I adore perch and it was the first proper fish I ever caught in the net I was pond dipping very very many years ago many moons ago I was pond dipping and uh, I caught my first perch with the last drag of the net uh, on a school trip than on the River Darrenth than in Kent. And um, ever since then, the perch, watching John Wilson on Go Fishing catch perch and um, so on and so forth, it's just captured my imagination. I think it's because it's, if you look at a perch, it's so very different to any other uh, beautiful British call species. Um, the colours are vibrant in the reds and the fins, you've got the stripe markings down the back of the down the back of the uh, the body, it's just there's something different about a perch. I think the swagger, I think the the attitude, the pack hunters as they get bigger they tend to become more solitary or in pairs. There's just something about them. They're almost like a hunting dog um, mentality of a of a of a perch or a sergeant, as we like to call them, or stripies. I think in America you guys call them red fins. Um, it's quite funny with the old perch because they colonise most of the. Uh, most of the globe now, I think they actually live in uh, New Zealand and Australia. The European perch was moved over there, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, back to the matter in hand. We're going to make a perch bob today, which is probably one of the most recognisable floats on the market. You don't find many tackle companies actually making perch floats nowadays, the perch bobber. Um, back in the day when I had my very first perch bobber, um, it was bought. Uh, an old tackle shop called Downham Tackle, which unfortunately now is closed, and it was um, it was very much a traditional looking one. I've got a very similar how they looked. That's a perch bobber for any of you guys that have never ever seen it before or unaware of what a perch bobber is. That's how a perch bobber looks. It's a very traditional. This particular one that I made. It's actually got my initial on now. It's very uh, reminiscent to what an original perch bobber would look like um, very traditional looking cork body um, you know hard stem with uh, whipping done in a spiral it's very very traditional looking um, but what you can do nowadays is you can go a little bit crazy with stuff you know a little bit of an idea as you guys have seen possibly on my recent um, Facebook page and that is the uh, the perch pattern bobber now this one I actually come up with the idea from from the lure anglers I was thinking, why has no one ever made a fishing float to replicate the markings and the colours of the fish you're fishing for? Now, I've seen it done on a pike float, but I've never seen it done on a perch float. And there we go. That's my interpretation. This is only a, a prototype. This is going to get better, hopefully, as I um, put more time and effort into making it. Uh, this is, like I say, first generation. So I'd like to see what uh, the 10th generation is going to look like because I've got lots of ideas to improve this float. So side by side, slightly different. So you've got the traditional style one, very similar to what I had as a kid, as a youngster. And then you've got a modern style pattern one. Now, the perch bobber, I can't tell you the history of it because... Quite frankly, I don't really know too much about the history of it. I could tell you my history like I have done. It was the first time I ever caught a perch was on a bobber. And the feeling and watching the way a bobber moves in the water, the way it bobs up and down with a worm underneath and then finally gets moved away by a, by a nice perch. You know, a nice perch to me back then would have been four or five ounces. 
uh, there's no greater feeling other than live bait fishing for me which again if you make these large enough like these two you could use like small live baits like minnows and bleak and gudgeon these would be perfect for so what we're going to do in this particular video I'm going to make it the most basic simple way to catch a uh, to make a float for perch uh, the perch bobber now you can make it as elaborate as I say like this one as you want or as basic or as simple as that one now I'm not going to tell you every tactics and tips and stuff like that. I am going to give away little bits and pieces, but it's really for you guys to find out yourself exactly how a perch bobber, um, how you want your perch bobber to be. Because I've done a lot of research leading up to learning how to float make, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning the trade. There are some fantastic float makers out there from um, uh, from Graham Pinkerton to Andrew Fields to Dave Pierce and. Um, you know, you know, there's just some absolutely fantastic float makers out there. And uh, go and research. Go and have a little look. Do what I've done. I mean, I'm going to try and make this video so it's simple for you guys to understand. Step by step, a basic way of making a perch bobber and then you can make it your own. It's almost like a joke. You know, if you remember the punchline on a joke, you can make you can make the joke your own. As long as you get the punchline. So without further ado, what we're going to do is we're going to start step by step. Uh, we're going to start off showing you some of the wood materials I'm going to use to make the most basic of perch bobbers. So, let's get on with it and see uh, and see how we get on. Right, welcome back folks. So, we're going to start the uh, the first part of the video, which is the uh, build process. First of all, I'm going to talk you through the main, the main uh, components in terms of the wooden material side of it. Um, I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about stage by stage lacquering painting if you want to put thread on it if you want to sign it if you want to put stickers on it how to whip an eye on there if you want an eye on there we're going to come back with all that throughout the video but to start with i just want to show you the basic materials that you can use now the two main bodies of uh, materials i like to use um, are cork and bolster they're very, very lightweight pieces of wood and they're fantastic to use for, for, for holding up the float basically. So if, we, um, if I bring this one in here, this is one that's not finished. Uh, it's got a hardwood dowel body, uh, sorry, stem, which is made of walnut. And then the body, which is made of, uh, of, um, of bolster dowel. And then if you look at this one here, which you've seen earlier. This one has got hardwood sta uh, dale, which is made of beech, which is very cheap material, very easy, very readily available. And then the body is made of cork. Uh, it's very traditional to cork as opposed to the the bolster. Very both very buoyant, especially the uh, the bolster. Very very buoyant. So you can see these two types of floats. Um, they're, they're equally the same, very slightly different shape between the two, but that's your preference. You can make those any shapes you like. We'll talk about that later on. But I just wanted to show you the difference between the two. So you've got cork and you've got balsa dale. Now, you're probably looking between 25 and 30 mil diameter. Uh, and then you can shape it down to the size you want it to be. When I get the uh, when I get these on the lathe, I'll show you. We we'll probably won't use the the bolster today. We'll actually use the the cork. I think it's nice putting the cork on there because it's very traditional. Now you can mount this straight from the off as it is, but what a lot of people like to do, I've never tried it as of yet, but a lot of people like to boil it. So if you put your champagne or wine corks into a pan of boiling water. Um, make sure your missus isn't home or your uh, you know <laughs> or your mum's not home using her pots and pans because it does give up a bit of a smell and uh, it's not very nice by all accounts and uh, I'm sure that she won't be too pleased so boil these up and what will happen is it will bring back to its original form well I say original form it will come back to its sort of probably expand a little bit and it will be a lot sleeker almost like the uh, balsa dale um, the reason why they've been formed like this is so they can be pushed into bottles to keep it airtight. So you can do that. Personally, I don't bother. But by all accounts, if you do do it, it makes it a lot easier for sanding down. Um, but again, that's your choice. Now, in terms of the stem materials, which you see up here, 
before here. There are other stems you don't see here today. Some people use broken bits of old uh, fly rods, uh, especially if they they want to make a very very nice um, a very very nice float. You know, someone like uh, Andrew Fields likes to use green heart fly rods, uh, broken ones. He'll turn them down on the lathe, and they just look so traditional and so beautiful. Um, you could use uh, carbon. You can use carbon stems, maybe broken carbon cart rods even, or spinning rods. You can use bits of carbon, uh, the tips from a feeder rod, that kind of thing if you want to. Again, can look very, very natural, very nice. Uh, very modernised, I would say, using uh, carbon. But um, just imagine, if you was going to fit the body over the top of the stem, if you think it's going to be heavier, it's, it's more than enough and buoyant to keep it up. So the heavier the stem will be, yeah? obviously the less shot that's going to be needed to, to, to cock the float. Now, I'm going to tell you about the materials I've got in front of me today. So the first one is bamboo. This is a 3mm, but you can get it in all different sizes. Bamboo skewer. Bamboo skewers are so, so cheap. You can go to any supermarket and buy these, maybe a pan shop, panda pack, really, really, really cheap. A very lightweight and very strong material. Um, a very good choice for the beginner, if that's what you want to use. Next one is like a, a lollipop stick uh, that you put po lollipops on, like the chips chips and all, or whatever they're called, chips chips. This one is a uh, six mil because I use this for making pike floats. Um, and what's good about using this as a material is that you can fish the line through the centre. So if you most floats uh, that you make for purchasing, they've got either an eye on the bottom. Again, you'll see all this later. Um, or you can fish it with rubber bands like I like to fish it, uh, traditional style. Um, but if you wanted to fish it in line, you can certainly use uh, tubing like that. Like I say, these are lollipop type tubing ones. They're very lightweight and very good to use. The next one is a, a reed actually, believe it or not. It doesn't look like a reed, but trust me, it is a reed. It's called Secund Secundra Reed, something like that, Secundra Reed. You can buy this on eBay. Again, you can buy all these materials on eBay, really. That's why I tend to buy most of my materials, because it's very convenient for me to do it that way, and you can buy in bulk. Um, it's got a very waxy membrane on it. best way to do this is, uh, like I say, just to sand it a little bit. Um, I mean, you should sand all your materials, apart from the plastic. But sand it a little bit, which makes it easier for when you're putting uh, sander seal on. But again, we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we're, we're making our perch bob. But this is a, a very buoyant, very strong material. Not as strong as Dale, uh, a hard Dale, but it's a, it's a nice uh, alternative. Like I say, very, very buoyant. The last one is what we're going to be using, which is the hardwood Dale. Simple hardwood. Again, you can buy loads of these on eBay. Various different millimetres. I use between three and six mil for perch floats. Predominantly use four and five mil for most of my floats. This is five mil. This is what we're going to be using. Um, this, I think, again is made of beach. Not too sure, but you can get various, various different materials uh, from different woods, should I say, from this one, which is uh, very expensive. Uh, this is well for what you're getting. This is walnut, but you can get cherry. You can get ash. There's all different types of uh, wood you can use. But I like to use um, for basic. If I'm going to paint over it, then I want to use something like that. You know, something basic and cheap. Now, if you want to show the beauty of the wood, let me show you a float I'm working on at the moment. So if you look at the beauty of that dark wood there, it's not dyed or anything. It's just had uh, a coating of sand or sealer on it. That's actually worn up. That's what we just see a minute ago. And it's so beautiful. You can whip over the top of that with some thread, maybe a yellow thread or a green thread. Look absolutely beautiful. Like I say, this is not finished, this float. Um, but that just shows you the detail of some of the woods can look absolutely beautiful. Uh, and painting over that, apart from the tip, obviously, because you have to. Um, but painting over that, that will uh, that will ruin the woods, in my opinion. But you'll find your, your favourite type of woods to use and... Uh, you know that one now but I'm showing you how to make a basic perch bobber today so it's not about uh, it's not about buying bo expensive beautiful woods so what we're going to do is we're going to take these away and basically these are the two items we're going to be using to make our perch bobber so what we're going to do is uh, without further ado I'm going to get all the tools together and I'm going to show you the next step on how we go about putting this together 
Right folks, yeah, just before I move on, I thought I'd actually show you this. Um, there is other materials you can use as stems, which I didn't actually uh, speak about very briefly. Um, porcupine quill, as you can see there. Uh, I buy in porcupine quill again off of eBay, but I actually get these from China, very cheap from China. I have to wait ages for them, so bearing in mind if you ever do order any off of eBay, majority of them will come from China if you see them for really cheap. Uh, I think I get something like five for £1.50, something like that. And um, I order in bulk in one go, so I may spend say 20 quid's worth on uh, on porcupine quill so I may have to wait up to six seven weeks for them sometimes um, but it's worth the wait they're really good they're quite cheap to be fair there are a lot better quality porcupine quills than what you see here um, again they got a very strange membrane on them that they will need to be prepared uh, a light sanding with um, with some uh, uh, double A wall uh, wire wall uh, you could use that or very 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 fine wet dryer sandpaper maybe a free 320 grit something like that but again we'll talk all about stuff like that later on I just wanted to show you you got porcupine quills you can use you can actually see there's a float there it's not been lacquered so it's not finished and that was actually made from a porcupine quill the whole lot it's not just the, the stem it's actually the tip as well it's it's a line through that goes through cork um, other than that, you can also use quills. A lot of people in terms use bird quills, so goose quills, duck quills, crow quills, pretty much peacock quills. There's so many different quills you can use. I think someone even has been using cormorant quills recently on uh, on YouTube, I noticed. But yeah, if you have a look around, you can use different types of quills from the, um, from the bird family. So yeah, two other materials I thought I'd actually note because it's a bit strange that I didn't that you can use for making stems or floats as well right folks so next stage stage two so the first stage is obviously showing you the materials in terms of the wood okay there are other materials components as we go further on we'll show you those and we'll talk more about those but I don't want to blow your mind too soon so next stage um, is to actually uh, make a hole in the uh, body so we've selected our cork this is the cork we're actually going to go for okay it's quite a large one but again when we go on the lathe uh, we will shape it to the how we want it to be um, so what we need to do with this particular piece of cork again I'm not going to boil it down um, is make a hole in the centre now do not worry about making it ultra ultra perfect because when you put it on a lathe you can correct that as it's spinning you can correct it with the shaping and the sanding so seriously do not worry about it we are going to come on to actually making a hole in a moment and then we'll talk about the various different techniques you can do that but let me show you the materials we've got first of all so we've got our cork body so if I pop that down for one moment okay so in order to make the hole in the cork we need to center the cork now there are different ways you can do it I've got two tools here this is uh, I'm not sure what this is called it's like a bell um, and what it's, it's like a hole punch in the middle you've got a uh, don't know if you can see that there uh, anything you put this over round a piece of wood like a dale um, you put it over the top you hit it with a hammer and it imprints a hole in the center dead center so I'll show you how to do that really really briefly so you take your, your cork which is round it's not perfect no cork is perfect and then what you do is you, you withdraw that back you would put that over the top, obviously on a, a hard surface like that. Get it nice and flush, nice and even. And then obviously you would strike that with a mallet or a hammer, something like that. You know, you could do it with your hand, be careful. You could do it with your hand and what it will do is, it will leave a little indentation, a little impression. And that's centre. Okay, so there is that particular method you can use by using these. They're probably they're on eBay. You can find them. Um, I can't quite remember what it's called actually. I'll have to leave a, a, a little um, line in the front just telling you what it's called. Uh, and then you've got this cent center marking point. Now some people make these. You can get them in plastic. I've got a stainless steel one here, and you get different sizes. What this does is it finds the center of any round dowel or round, be it a piece of cork. So this cork or you know, a cork like that, or you can use any type of dale. Um, 
And what you would do is primarily you would place, so you get the cork and you, you take the centre marker and you pop it in the V. And then what you do is you turn it over like that. Okay, and then what you do is you take a pen or, you know, I've got a, a mechanical pencil and then you draw a line down where it meets. Just mark it, then turn the cork and then mark it again. Turn the cork, mark it again. And you can do it three or four times. Again, I'm no expert. I'm, you've got to remember, <laughs> well, you, for those of you that don't know me, I'm no expert in making things. This is things that I've learned over a, a period of time and uh, I continue to learn. So if you look there, I've actually, that's the hole I made earlier, but you can see I, I've actually marked it. So where that star is, where I've made that star, right in the centre is centre. So when we come to drill it, we'll drill it through the centre. So what we do is I'm going to flip it over the other side and do the same. Because I like to drill through both sides. Again, I'll show you that as we go. So let's just move these two tools out of the way. Like I say, I'll write in a, I'll write in a link, not in the link, but I'll put just below um, telling you what these items are called. They're around about between the seven and ten pound mark each, maybe even cheaper. Can't quite remember. I bought them a while ago. Okay, so what's left? We'll show you those in a moment. Okay, now we need to realise what type of dial we we want to go for, and what we've chosen is a five millimeter hardwood dial. Very very cheap. But I got so many different types of dowel. You wanna be, you wanna be right of the size. So what I use are calipers. Calipers. You may have seen these before if you're into making things. These are calipers, and what they do is they tell you, um, they tell you the actual what they are. You know, in turn, right down to the, right down to the millimeter. So just gonna pop those in the caliper. Just check to see the size. It's coming out at 482. So it's just under 5 mil, which is average. You know, I expected it to be around that. 482. Okay. And then what I need to do is I need to find a corresponding. You've probably seen these, these metal dowels. And then you're probably wondering what they're for. That's what I'm going to turn the cork on. So once I made the hole in the cork and I pushed the cork onto these. They're what I'm actually going to turn on the lathe. Now, you can use your wooden dowel, but that could be chucked, could be split, could be splintered. You end up spending a lot of money on these, whereas uh, if you turn them on a, a metal dowel, what will happen? These are stainless steel. Very cheap. I think I bought them for like £2.50 each, maybe even less. Um, some people use brass. I like to use stainless steel personally. Um, I find that the cork doesn't really slip too much on this particular um, on this particular uh, material, the stainless steel. But what I will say is, you need to make sure that um, try and go for a slightly tighter squeeze than you need. So we know our dowel, our wooden dowel, which is going to be the stem, is going to be five mil. Okay, give or take uh, 4.82, if I remember rightly. Then we need to find the corresponding, um, the corresponding uh, stainless steel. Now the biggest one, I think, is around six, but we'll check using the calipers uh, it's 5.9 okay so I've checked using the calipers it's 5.9 so yeah 6 mil that's a little bit too big if we use the 6 mil what happens when we put the 5 mil dowel in it will slip it's too much okay so we'll put that to one side next one down 4.86 so again that's perfect so it's a 5 mil give or take so that's the one we want, okay? If I've got it right, I've got a four and a three, all corresponding to the size of the dowels I like to use. So three, four, five, six, all perfect for making wagglers, making, I'm, I'm talking about making bodies here. So if you wanna make a, uh, a tench float as an example, and you wanna make a, um, a cork body, let me show you as an example. This is a tench float that's not actually finished at the moment, but if you wanted to make the body for it, 
uh, and you want to use a thinner stem, then obviously, say for instance, I wanted this is a, a five mil, believe it or not. But if I wanted to make a three mil stem, then obviously I use the three mil rod to do that with. Okay, because if I use a if I use a three mil rod and I want to put a five mil in there, it's going to be so tight it's not going to go in. Whereas if I use say uh, a six mil a six mil metal one and I want to put a three mil in, it's just going to fall through. So you need to really correspond and try and give yourself a, sn a snug tight fit if you can. So that's a tench float. Again, I know it's not a perch float and that's what the video is about, but that's just giving you an example. Okay, so canopers out of the way. Just to one side. The smaller ones out of the way. So we've got our dale, our hardwood dale, our corresponding rod which is 5mm 5mm or 4.85 or whatever around that size what we need to do then is find a drill piece now this little set here I bought the Boss drill piece it doesn't really matter you could buy drill pieces for really really cheap um, from your your local hardware store all this stuff like I keep I will keep saying through the video you can buy it from eBay you can buy it I mean you probably have it in your dad's shed if you're a young kid if your dad will allow you to use his tools, I'm sure you guys have got, if you have your own shed, uh, then you've got a ma most of these tools in there, you know. Um, so these are drill bits. Okay, so we're using the 5. So we're doing a 5mm dowel. So we want a 5mm um, drill piece. There we go. And that will make the hole in the centre of the... Um, in the centre of the cork, which we're going to do next. That's the next job to do. So I'm going to mount this. Now, there are two ways of doing it. Well, there's a couple of ways of doing it, which I'm going to talk to you in, in the next section. So I'm just going to put this to one side, and I'm going to bring you back when I've got it all set up, and I'll talk you through how to make the holes in the centre of the body. Okay, so for the next part, we're actually going to make the hole. Now, there are many different ways you can make the hole. You can use a hand drill if you're very careful. You can actually mount the uh, the drill piece onto your lathe and do it that way. Again, you've got to be very careful. But what I've decided to do, because I'm making more floats than the average person, uh, I've decided to actually go and buy myself uh, a little drill press. Now, drill presses, you can actually get quite a large drill press quite cheaply, a desktop one, um, for about £100. And they're probably twice the size of this one. But this one is actually a jeweler's drill press. I bought again off eBay for about £40. Uh, this is called a Katsu, Katsu, Katsu. I don't think it really matters. I think they all come out of the same factory, just they put different names on it and different colours for the company. Now, I'm not going to talk about the workings of this drill. Um, it's not for that video. It's not It's not for that. It's just to make a hole. But you can actually change the speed settings on there. Um, that's the drill pull down, which will actually make the hole. Um, because it's such a small drill, I will have to turn over and do both sides to get the same hole. Okay, so what we'll do, um, if this was bolster, there is actually another way of doing it, which uh, my friend, uh, um, Gary, oh, Gary? Uh, <laughs> Graham Pinkerton actually does. I'll leave a link up in his, um, to his channel up in my... Um, right hand corner so you can go and have a check out of what he does um, when he uses the uh, the the bolster dowel he'll actually use he's got like a, a long sort of stick thing like a long brass rod that he sharpened at the end and he actually punches a hole through it uh, he's made a handle for it and everything it's uh, it looks like a screwdriver but it's hollow and it actually makes a hole that way now I have actually made some myself for, for doing for bolster but I actually prefer to do it this way. Uh, that way I can actually do quite a few floats. Now I'm making this particular float for you guys to see how they're made, but behind this I'm actually making another 30 or 40 floats on top. So in between showing you how I'm making this perch bob, I'm actually making floats on top of what I'm showing you. So we'll go ahead, we'll actually make a hole in this one. Very, very simple. Um, be very, very careful. Now normally I have a part, uh, it's like a, how can I put it? It's a block that you put the, the actual cork into so your fingers don't go near this because it gets very fast and very hot. Um, you've got to be very careful when using power tools. Um, but I, I'm going to hold this by hand and be very, very gentle and very careful. I'm only going to make a small hole in it. Okay, I'll probably come down a couple of times just to hollow it out. 
Now, with using cork, <laughs> when you're using cork and you're using uh, materials like bolster, they leave a lot of dust behind. So always wear a dust mask. Um, I do have some. Let me show you the one I'm using. You can get proper ones. You can buy proper ones, but I'm using these dust masks. They're cheap, gain off eBay. I used to use these in previous jobs, so I know they work. But for the purposes of this uh, video, I'm not actually going to wear it just to make this one cork. But normally, and off camera when I make the rest of them, I will be wearing it. Now, you want some type of extractor. Unless you're doing this in the garden, or on your balcony, or outside, uh, you really want to be opening all your windows up, unless you've got a workshop, but you need to open all your windows up, which I've done. Um, sorry about the noise if you can hear it outside, I live on the main road. And this is all being done in my bedroom, by the way. Uh, I've actually got this handheld. I have got a big dust extractor, uh, believe it or not, vacuum cleaner. But when I'm doing small projects like this, I use my handheld. Uh, again, it's a workshop. It's made by Draper. Probably, I think it was about £35 from eBay again I got it off of uh, and it just extract the dust uh, I can do it while I'm working or after I finish I'm gonna do it after I finished so again protective goggles if you've got any just protect your eyes I wear glasses just to prove I wear glasses so I should be okay uh, I'm not gonna wear a mask like I say for this this just this two second thing okay so get it dead center before turning it on as much as you possibly can. I like to prick it first. Okay. I'll tell you what, let me zoom in for you. There we go. So I've zoomed in a little bit. Hopefully you'll be able to see it a little bit better. So hold it very, very firm because I don't want it spinning. You need to really clamp down. So if you've got a clamp, even better. I'm using my fingers. You have to be very, very, very careful. You shouldn't really be doing it this way, but I am, and I'm just going to take my time with it. Now the speed dial, so I'll turn it off again, the speed dial I can make it as fast as possible. If I go really fast, I hope you can hear me, if I go really really fast, it's going to cut quicker. But I can also have accidents a bit that way, so I'm going to have it about half. So about there, and I'm just going to come down really really slowly. It's not a race. Simple as that. And that's done halfway through. So I need to turn over and do the other half. So let me just show you the hole. There you go. How nice, neat and simple is that? You know, like I say, you can use your lathe. There's all different ways. Let's turn it back on and do the other side. There we go. As you can see, it makes quite a bit of mess. All can be overed up afterwards. So what we need to do now is get our metal rod and see if we can push it through. Might be a bit tight to start with. Yeah, it's just a little bit tight at the moment. There we go. It was a little bit tight, needed a bit of encouraging. Um, but there we go. Metal rod all the way through. Very, very tight. It's actually quite a good thing. So let me push that down. I'm going to bring the camera back. There we go. So, there we go. We've got the uh, the cork. It's a little bit off centre, but it's mounted. It's a little bit off centre, but it's mounted very tightly on the uh, on the block on the block on the uh, metal dowel. Okay, so that metal dowel is going to simulate what a five mil wooden dowel is going to be when we eventually have it finished so it's all about getting the shape of that now so on the next part of this video I'm going to shape it I'm going to put it on the dowel and then on the wooden dowel I'm going to do any little curvings at the edges you know finish off the dowel and then that will be it for this part of the video so keep watching uh, like I say I'm going to shape this down which you're going to see next 
then I'm going to do the wooden dowel and then we will come back on a part two video so just going to stop it there for the moment join me in a join me in a sec when we start the next part okay so on to the next stage uh the messy stage probably the stage that's the most fun to do but it's the horriblest when you're making a mess because just the amount of cork that comes off so as you can see i have I'm going to show you from this camera angle, and then when I actually do the uh, the shaping, you'll see it from a different angle. Uh, there won't be much talking because obviously um, the noise of the laver be on and the hoover and that. So what we won't do is uh, we will talk through the actual uh, process of uh, the shaping. Now, if you look just there, I've actually got my little hand hoover set up as a little extractor if it gets a little bit too heavy because it's the first time i'm doing this with just a hand hoover then i'll put the uh the proper extractor on i've got a big hoover extractor under the desk uh, and i'll put that on but for the ease of use and um, just to show you guys at home that you don't need to have all the it equipment just to build your own floats now before as i say i start sort of making the float uh creating the uh the angles and the shapes on the on the cork just going to run you through a few bits and pieces so you've seen the hoover i've got that mounted just on a couple of blocks of wood just here uh, and that's just to prop it up really i'm going to put it just in front of where this will be so it'll you'll actually uh extract extract most of the dust up as i'm actually turning now let's talk a little bit about the lathe now this is a little bit special um because i'm into my float making i've actually stepped up uh the quality of lathe i use i use a very really cheap chinese lathe that i got off of ebay for about 37 quid they're very 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 readily available very easy to buy very easy to use any person that's getting into float making i do ultimately say to you go and buy one of those chinese lathes they're really cheap but they do work uh, mine lasted for about two and a half years two years um absolutely brilliant probably can last you a lot longer but i was doing a lot of turning not just floats but other stuff as well uh, as a bit of a hobby now that was around 37 quid this particular one was 130 or 140 quid but you need to look around because it, it can be as much as as um it can be as much as 150 160 quid it's a german brand this one as far as i'm aware uh it's the proxon if you go on to ebay uh, not ebay youtube and you actually put that in and have a look at it you'll see there's a little video that tells you a little bit about this it's about a two minute video so it's the uh, proxon db 250 okay now this particular thing on the lathe this chuck uh i bought separately it's a free jaw truck chuck sorry as you can see um this particular one i bought you don't get it as standard with the lathe now you don't necessarily need this chuck because it's got little how can i pull it i don't know what you would call them i'm not very how can i pull it i'm not minded when it comes to technical stuff but it's these things here and you get various different sizes different size mills that you would would go through and it would hold the um it would hold the the wood in place i like the chuck jaws personally um when you buy the cheap lathe the 37 quid chinese jobby it comes with a chuck on it um most of most things i'm going to be turning are not going to only be any more than say eight mil but if i do want to turn larger items that jaw comes wide open it gets quite big it goes up to about 15 mil i think but some lathes will go even bigger still now if I had a long piece of wood as well, I can actually go through the center of the lathe and come out the end. There's actually a little hole, as you can see there. The wood can go all the way through and you just firmly fix it in place by using the chuck. Now, I had no idea about power. To I did a little bit of technology at school and carpentry and crafting, but I didn't know, I know nothing about lathes when I bought one. I didn't know how it worked, what it was about, what I needed to do. And that's where the, the research comes down to you to look into it yourself. You know, I can show you a few bits and pieces and other people on YouTube, but you really need to do the research yourself. On this lathe as well, this part, which is another smaller chuck, um doesn't come as standard neva i bought that separately so it's worked out a fair bit of money that comes with this this is the chuck that actually come with it it's not actually a chuck what it does is that actually goes into the piece of wood and it just holds it in place uh, i wanted something that actually holds the rod itself uh, rather than just pushed 
uh, pressure, so to speak. You know, when you push that in, it pushes the pressure. So rather than have the rod through the centre, uh, you have that pushed into the actually into the wood itself. Now I don't want to get too technical because it's not it's not a technical video. I'm trying to keep things simple. But what I'm trying to say to you is, is get yourself a lathe, a standard lathe, and it will do exactly the same job as this expensive lathe. Uh, lathes can go two, three, four, five, up to a thousand pound and more. This is a nice lathe, it's very quiet. I'm gonna turn it on really briefly for you. It's got a lovely action to it. That's at its lowest setting. As you turn it up, it goes faster. Now with a faster speed rotation, what will happen is, is you can cut, I can actually cut the, um, the dowel at the same time when I actually shape the dowel. So we'll show you about shaping the dowel after. Uh, at the moment I just want to show you shaping the, uh, the float. So I don't want to run before we can walk. So let me turn that off. So yep, yeah, you can get yourself one of those little cheap jobbies and then we'll do the exact same job. As you can see in the background there, I've got loads of other floats I've got waiting as well as some there as well but at the moment we're concentrating on this basic per perch bobber so i'm going to get it all set up and then i'm going to do a little bit of shaping shaping is really your own there's nothing i can really tell you about shaping you know the shape you're trying to go for is is to get the shape of what a perch bobber looks like get as many pictures you can research on youtube that kind of thing exactly what i did and it you know even if you own some perch bobs yourself maybe plastic ones or or some old school ones just look at the shape of them but like i say you can have them as thin as you want as wide as you want as small as you want it's entirely up to you so i'm just going to make whatever comes into mind uh i'm going to make it look like a perch bobber style try and keep it classical if i can so i'm going to turn this off now and i'm going to head over to the other camera which is set up just in front of the just in front of the lathe and uh we'll do a little bit of shaping Okay folks, so as you can see I've actually got it mounted in the chuck at the moment. So it's on the 5mm rod, it's a 5mm hole, it's very very snug tightly fit, so it shouldn't, as it's turning, it shouldn't slip. That's exactly what we're looking for when we're doing this. The last thing you want that to do is slip. If it starts slipping up and down you're not going to get a perfect, uh, you're not going to get a perfect shape on it. So what we're trying to go for is that very classic egg shaped look. I do apologise if you can hear noise outside. I have to have the room ventilated while I'm doing this because of the amount of dust that kicks up. So yeah, we're trying to go for that classic egg shape that you see on the body of a perch bobber. Now, like I say, this is each to their own. You can do this exactly how you want it to be. There is no right or wrong way of doing it. If you want it to be slender, any, if you, say for instance you create five floats with five different looks, it doesn't matter. It all depends on what bait you want to fish, how you want it to look, uh, and how much shot you want to pull under. So I'm just going to give you a quick look. It's got a bit of a wobble to it. As you can see, I've got it up quite high. Let's turn it down low. You can see it's a bit of a wobble to it, but that will even out as we shape it. As I go at a higher speed like that, as you saw at a higher speed, that will, uh, that will help me shape it and get a nice even uh, finish. Now, there are two ways of doing this. You could use the, uh, you can use a, a chisel. You know, you, you've probably seen chisels before. I think I may have one that came with my old Chinese lathe, which is, which is one of these. You can get them a lot wider, obviously, and you can sort of peck away at it, let it move up and down, and it will chip away. I don't like using these personally. Um, it's a lot quicker doing it this way, but I find. If you do it that way, you can lose the shape you want in your mind. Uh, I like using sandpaper because I can I can take my time to, to curve the shape that I have in my mind's eye, how I want it to look. Now, what you could do is a lot of research online to, to look at perch bobbers because there's so many different shapes and forms out there. You can decide how you want it to look yourself. Now, what I will say, there's three types of sandpaper I like to use. You've got, sorry, just there, three types you can see got a very 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 coarse one then you've got a medium and then a very light sandpaper so I think this is a 60 a 120 for the medium and then the heavy coarse one is about 240 now you can get various different size sandpapers like I say uh, we'll start with a very coarse one then we go to sanding it down when I get a little bit closer to how I want the shape to be with this one 
and then once it's got pretty much the shape I want just to make sure you get it nice and smooth we use the smooth sandpaper okay so I'm going to crack on and start with this one now this cork is probably going to end up half the size if anything at all but the reason why I use a full size cork is it gives me plenty of play depending on what shape I want to go for so we're going to turn all the equipment on you won't hear me talking in this uh, part of the video uh, maybe I'll speed it up and you'll see how the actual process is done So, don't be afraid to turn it on and off, as you saw me do. Um, I turn it on and off because I want to check to see the shape. To see if it's giving me the shape that I want, the shape I desire. Um, it's not too bad. Uh, I've used all three sandpapers. So I've gone from the heavy duty, that really knocks a lot of the, um, the dust off. Sorry, knocks a lot of these, uh, the shavings off. Then I've gone down to uh, shape it really nicely. Once I've got a nice shape to it, then I'll go on to the, the very light sandpaper, which gives me a really, really nice, um, gives me a really nice finish to it. So it's nice and smooth. So we created quite a mess here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna open the lathe, take the, uh, take the, uh, the body off, just so we can have a little look at it, see if I'm happy with it just in case there's more work that needs to be done. It's a fairly large one. It's quite dusty. It's a fairly large one and it's quite dusty. But it's pretty much the shape we're after. As you can see, it's quite even. Let's take it off the uh, mount. So, there we go. Sorry, let's get it in front of the camera for you. So there we go. It's a little bit, bit toothed up there. I could, I could have maybe uh, Maybe a little bit more smoother, but there's some there's a way to combat that later with some thread. But I'm quite happy with uh, the shape and uh, the design that that's come off with. So what we're going to do? So I'm just going to show you the uh, dowel wood. So we're going to pop the dowel wood on just to see, make sure it's all goes in lovely. Wrong way. it up a little bit but we can fix that don't worry so there we go see this collar here is a little bit torn up so I could probably fix it up a little bit 
It's just one of those problems you have when you're making floats and you're new to it. Um, but there we go. That's pretty much the finished body on the uh, on the stem. Okay, so guys, finished the uh, the float body as you saw. It's just there. I've taken the liberty of actually putting the uh, the dowel, pulling it through the dowel. And what I've done is uh, using a pencil sharpener, just a standard cheap ordinary pencil sharpener. Uh, I've just put a chamfer on the end. I've just I've just uh, I don't know if you can catch it there. I've just put a little tip on it. I haven't made it like a pencil, it's not ultra sharp. I can shape that using the sandpaper on the lathe to get exactly how I want it to be. Uh, what I've also done as well is, I don't know if you can see just there, I've actually marked the length that I want the actual float to be. So, using a hacksaw, be very, very careful. Just using a hacksaw. don't want this to be perfect all I'm doing is cutting it and then I'm going to break it and I'll show you why in a moment okay there we go so I've just broken it so pretty much that's that's pretty much the perch float uh, from how I want it to be really now what I want to decide is do I want an eye on the end so just on the end here do I want to put an eye on now and fish it like a waggler style uh, you can still fish it with float rubbers as well or do I want to put a taper on the end a bit like the tip do I want to put a taper on the end uh, so I can I can fish it as a an, a, an old style the old way of doing it but what I'm gonna do for argument's sake and to show you guys how it's done uh, I'm gonna whip an eye on the end so what I want to do is I just want to neaten that part off you can use some sandpaper just hold it upright and that will create a nice neat flat edge there we go so you got a nice neat nice neat flat edge but what I'm gonna do with that is again I'm gonna put it in the lathe and I'm gonna just taper it down slightly using sandpaper so first things first I've come a bit further back on the lathe okay so let's get the float in get it tight Okay, let's just check the lathe's running right. So we've had it off for a moment. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the coarse sandpaper. Again, the same with the body. I'm now working on the. Uh, I'm now working on the the stem. So I'm not touching the body anymore. I'm just touching the stem. by hand if you want to and all I'm doing is neaten it up so I've got the medium sandpaper now just giving it that nice paper to the tip and I'm finishing off with the very 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 light sandpaper just to smoothen it off nice and smooth and I'm, let's turn it off and have a little look now I'm very very happy with that so what we're going to do is I'm going to take it out show you it it's very different to what you saw so there we go very very different to what you saw you can still see I made a, a bit of a hash you know I'm not frightened to show you the mistakes I make I've chipped away too much on the body but what I'm going to do is one step excuse it excuse the noise outside once that's uh, painted up and it's got threading on there you can hide that very very easily so don't worry about that too much I can go back and and fix it if I want to uh, but I don't want to take too much off the body because I'm happy with the, the, the size of the body that I've got but if you look at the tip as you can see the tip is absolutely perfect exactly how I want it you can have a round over tip if you wanted to I kind of like the pointier type tip I don't know why I just do so now that tip's done, that can go in. And now we're gonna work on the body. So we need to be very, very careful here. Now, all I'm gonna use is the, the, the standard sandpaper. I'm not gonna use uh, the coarse one, I'm just using the standard one. And all we're doing is putting a light sanding on it. 
just to bring it nice and smooth for when we're painting. And then using the end, just create a bit of a taper. I'm not using the, I'm not using the sharpener because I'm not going for a complete taper because I want to put the eye on it. There's nothing wrong with stopping your work and checking it. Yeah, very nice. It's going how I want it to go. Now you can do all this by hand. You ain't got to use the lathe to do this. I like using a lathe because I find it quicker and it can actually make it quite smooth as well. But if you do it by hand, it's going to take you longer to do. So just give the body a quick going over. Let's have a quick look. Nice and smooth. So, so practically, that's the perch bobber, really, without any cosmetics on it, complete. Like I say, I could go back and... That's nice and smooth, absolutely smooth. Let's move this lathe out of the way so you can get a proper look at what's going on. There we go. Nice and smooth. One perch bobber. So all we need to do now is put sander sealer on it. Next video, decorate it, paint it, put an eye on it. I'll show you some whipping. Um, decide how we want it to look. It's going to be a very basic bobber. So it's not going to be anything elaborate on this particular one. That's left to your imagination to put to basically make it how you want it to look. But if you look there, quite pleased with how that's come out. Like I say, it's not perfect. Uh, it's very it's in its raw form, and when it's decorated, like I say, it'll come out and look a lot lot better. So that's it for part one. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I say, I am a novice. I am still learning. Like I say, you know, I'm not 100% happy with the uh, the shouldering. I can make that a lot, lot better. And if I was making it for somebody, um, then I would spend a lot more time doing that. But that's a basic perch bobber. That's the shape. That's the pattern. And uh, like I say, come back for video two, where we will start to uh, treat it, start to dress it, and... Um, it will start taking shape and form really anyway tight line and dead baits guys thanks for watching don't forget to like comment subscribe and um i'll see you all soon